Welcome to this installment of Supplemental Lectures provided by PNC's Concurrent Enrollment Program. My name is Alexandra Kindle and I will share some information with you that pertains to History 151 as taught by me at Purdue North Central. Today's topic will focus on how colonial families made fabric, worked together for the survival and comfort of each other, and needed the labor of women in both a personal and economic matter. For much of the colonial era, most families had to make fabric in their own clothes. England be began industrializing textile manufacturing just prior to the rebellion of its North American colonies. So even though England was mass producing cloth from as early as the 1750s, even then English colonists had difficulties obtaining cloth. People outside of the port cities in the 1750s and 1760s did not have, a, have regular access to cloth made on the island. Moreover, after the French and Indian War, protests against Parliament's actions meant many colonists started boycotting island-made textiles. Thus, most colonists made cloth, and it was a time-consuming process that required planning, multiple skills, and the help of much of the family. Life in the colonial era was one of work. Almost every household member contributed in some manner based on sex, age, and family hierarchy. Families generally divided tasks for the sake of efficiency and order. Men did field work while women worked closer to home, cooking, cleaning, and raising children. They often also gardened, milked cows, and cared for poultry and fowl. There was so much work to do that families often hired servants, bought slaves, both north or south, or housed other family members to help. The husband and wife directed the work, but survival meant they needed all hands on deck, so to speak. This is true of many productions in the home. Textiles are pictured here, but this is also true of cooking, laundry, building, uh, and often harvest. While many tasks were assigned to women, we must be careful to check our feminist perspectives at the door. More than just women's work, colonials, colonial women's chores helped the family, and she needed her family's help as well. Before discussing textiles, I want to use the example of the one-pot stew to illustrate the interdependence of men and women. I borrowed this example from historian Rose Schwartz Cohen in her book, More Work for Mother. While cooking might have been a woman's job, we can see how everyone helped to make the main meal of many colonial people, the one-pot stew. Without the cook stove made available in the early 19th century, most people had to cook over an open fire. The pot hung from the lug pole as seen here, and various pans or pots could be used to make bread if the family did not have access to a baking oven as well as other dishes. In order to make the one-pot stew, it took the work of both men and women. Women gardened vegetables, preserved meat, and cooked the meal. They made brushes to clean pots in the fireplace, they cleaned up, they saved ashes to make lye soap, and they also made bread, cheese, beer, or cider to go with the, with the main meal. So what did men do? Well, men built, probably built the fireplace or bartered goods to get the fireplace built. Uh, they bought or bartered with the blacksmith for the lug pole and tools, they chopped and hauled wood for fire, raised and slaughtered animals for meat, and they raised the wheat to thicken the stew. That is not enough to explain the full, the full amount of work needed to make a one-pot stew. Children also helped. They picked up kindling, they brought in buckets of water, they helped in the garden. In the colonial period there were no pesticides, so getting rid of pests meant picking them off the plants and killing them. Uh, and they might have husked the corn. If there were servants, they would have been directed by the woman uh, for household duties to help get the meal on the table. So while, co while cooking could be defined as women's work, clearly it was more. The same could be sa said about men's work. If needed, women joined men, male children, and servants at harvest time. Survival depended on reaping crops, and women did go out if there were not enough field hands. Gender divisions of labor were useful ways to distribute work, but were not hard and fast rules. Survival was always the first rule. With all that said, we will see that making fabric, like the one pot stew, was a family affair. The three major tasks to make fabric included gathering the fibers, spinning the fibers, and weaving the thread. First there had to be a raw product to turn into thread. Until Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, most, most families relied on raising flax to make linen or sheep for wool. Both of these products would have been raised by the men of the family, 
Women then had to break the flax and wash and card the wool prior to spinning. There are several ways to spin fibers into thread, but both require careful attention from the spinner. Using a spinning wheel, the spinner moved the wheel by rocking a pedal with her foot. She used her hands to guide the right amount of fiber into the wheel. Consistent width meant nice fabric. Lumpy thread did not. Uh, I've provided links with this course uh, for looking at how to spin, but you can find many of these on you many videos on YouTube. Spinning generally was woman's work, and it was a task she did between other chores or during chores as uh, such as cooking or childcare. And you can see here this woman is doing all three. And if you consider the rifle in the window, she might have also been protecting her home. Spinning has been around for thousands of years and became a part of everyday life that was, was featured in the grim fairy tales and other stories in the 19th century. The spinning wheel was invented during the Middle Ages, so it's been around for a long time. People have also become interested in spinning more recently. As life becomes more modern and disconnected, people look back to a seemingly more simple time, especially in crafts such as quilting, knitting, and fiber arts. For, these are, for, for us, these are hobbies. For colonists and 19th century Americans, quilting and knitting made wearables to stay warm and survive bitter winters. And of course, without spinning, there is nothing to knit or loom. Here are a few images of spools that were used both with the spinning wheel as on the right and in the loom. Multiple spools were needed to weave fabric. A wide variety of tools were used to prepare thread or yarn. The image on the bottom right shows dyed yarn drying. Colonial families wanted pleasant colors and used various plants from tea to indigo to dye fabric for clothes or household linens. In England, on the island or in the colonies, generally women spun, but they handed the thread over to men, as seen in this image, to weave into fabric. Setting up the loom and weaving fabric took skills. As with most chores, these skills were taught by family members. Around 10 years old, parents started teaching same-sex children their skills. So a mother taught her daughter to spin and cook, while a father taught his boy his trades, such as farming and weaving. Please see links provided for this class uh, about weaver, how weavers operated the loom using both their hands and their feet. This was definitely a skill and not something that people did for fun. Over time, colonial families and then early Americans had access to more and more goods, but in the meantime they made what they could, working together for the good of the family. As conditions changed, there, there were slight changes to our story. As people in port cities got access to island-made fabric, they often gave up spinning and weaving. Yet the American Revolution added new wrinkles to the fabric of the story. Get it? Fabric? Wrinkles? As people in the port cities decided to give up buying island-made products for political reasons, because of the war they were unable to get access, the Daughters of Liberty started public spinning bees. With men busy, women took over the task of weaving as well. Considering the amount of skill this took, not all the fabric was of the best quality, but people wore homespun with pride because despite its flaws, it was now imbued, may I say, interwoven, with political meaning. After the Revolution, women continued weaving well into the 19th century until English cloth returned and Americans started their own production in the 1810s in the factories and places such as Lowell. So we will revisit the importance of fibers and textiles in later lectures. For now, thank you for joining me today. I hope you will do a bit of web surfing to investigate this fascinating topic further.